Chapter 30. The Elimination of the Sasanian, Dynasty, which held sway for 542 years. The birth of Muhammad and the entrance of the sons of Ishmael into the land of Armenia. The death of Heraclius and the reign of Constantine. I shall discuss the, line of the, son of Abraham, not the one, born, of a free, woman, but the one born of a serving maid, about whom the quotation from scripture was fully and truthfully fulfilled, his hands will be at everyone, and everyone will have their hands at him, Genesis 16. 11, 12. Twelve peoples, representing, all the tribes of the Jews assembled at the city of Edessa. When they saw that the Iranian troops had departed and left the city in peace, they, 122, closed the gates and fortified themselves. They refused entry to troops of the Roman lordship. Thus Heraclius, emperor of the Byzantines, gave the order to besiege it. When, the Jews, realized that they could not militarily resist him, they promised to make peace. Opening the city gates, they went before him, and, Heraclius, ordered that they should go and stay in their own place. So they departed, taking the road through the desert to Tashkast and to the sons of Ishmael. The Jews, called, the Arabs, to their aid and familiarized them with the relationship they had through the books of the, Old, Testament. Although, the Arabs, were convinced of their close relationship, they were unable to get a consensus from their multitude, for they were divided from each other by religion. In that period a certain one of them, a man of the sons of Ishmael named Muhammad, a merchant, became prominent. A sermon about the way of truth, supposedly at God's command, was revealed to them, and, Muhammad, taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially since he was informed and knowledgeable about Mosaic history. Because the command had, G 104, come from on high, he ordered them all to assemble together and to unite in faith. Abandoning the reverence of vain things, they turned toward the living God, who had appeared to their father, Abraham. Muhammad legislated that they were not to, 123, eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsehoods, and not to commit adultery. He said, God promised that country to Abraham and to his son after him, for eternity. And what had been promised was fulfilled during that time when, God, loved Israel. Now, however, you are the sons of Abraham, and God shall fulfill the promise made to Abraham and his son on you. Only love the God of Abraham, and go and take the country which God gave to your father, Abraham. No one can successfully resist you in war, since God is with you. Then all of them assembled together, from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt, the text is corrupt here. The citation is from Genesis 25.18, and they set out from the Pan Desert, being, twelve tribes, moving, in the order, of precedence, of the houses of the patriarchs of their tribe. They were divided into twelve thousand men, of which the sons of Israel were in their own tribes, one thousand to a tribe, to lead them to the country of Israel. They travelled army by army in the order, of precedence, of each patriarchy, Neviot, Kada, Abiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Dumar, Massa, Hadod, Tema, Jator, Nefish and Kedema, Genesis 25. 13-16. These are the peoples of Ishmael. They reached Moabite Rabbath, at the borders of, 124, Rubens, land. The Byzantine army was encamped in Arabia. The Arabs, fell upon them suddenly, struck them with the sword and put to flight Emperor Heraclius' brother, Theodosius. Then they turned and encamped in Arabia. All the remnants of the sons of Israel then assembled, G105, and united, becoming a large force. After this they dispatched a message to the Byzantine emperor, saying, God gave that country as the inherited property, Icaluit Shorhangitian, of Abraham and of his sons after him. We are the sons of Abraham. It is too much that you hold our country. Leave in peace, and we shall demand from you what you have seized, plus interest. The emperor rejected this. He did not provide a fitting response to the message but rather said, The country is mine. Your inheritance is the desert. So go in peace to your country. And, Heraclius, started organizing brigades, as many as seventy thousand, troops, giving them as a general, a certain one of his faithful eunuchs. He ordered that they were to go to Arabia, stipulating that they were not to engage them, 125, in war, but rather to keep on the alert until he could assemble his other troops and send them to help. Now, the Byzantines, reached the Jordan and crossed into Arabia. Leaving their campsite on the riverbank, the Byzantines, went on foot to attack, the Arabs, camp. 
The Arabs, however, had placed part of their army in ambuscades here and there, lodging the multitude in dwellings around the camp. Then they drove in herds of camels which they penned around the camp and the tents, tying them at the foot with rope. Such was the fortification of their camp. The beasts were fatigued from the journey, and so, the Byzantines, were able to cut through the camp fortification, and started to kill, the Arabs. But suddenly the men in the ambuscade sprung from their places and fell upon them. Or the Lord came over the Byzantine troops, and they turned in flight before them. But they were unable to flee because of the quicksand which buried them to the legs. There was great anxiety caused by the heat of the sun and the enemy's sword was upon them. All the generals fell and perished. More than two thousand men were slain. A few survivors fled to the place of refuge. The Arabs, crossed the Jordan and encamped at Jericho. Then dread of them came over the inhabitants of the country, and all of them submitted, g 106. That night the Jerusalemites took, 126, the cross of the Lord and all the vessels of the churches of God, and fled with them by boat to the palace at Constantinople. The Jerusalemites, requested an oath, from the Arabs, and then submitted. The emperor of the Byzantines was no longer able to assemble his troops against them. The Arabs, divided their army into three parts. One part went to Egypt, taking, territory, as far as Alexandria. The second part went north, to war, against the Byzantine Empire. In the twinkling of an eye they had seized, territory stretching, from the sea to the shores of the great Euphrates River, as well as Edessa and all the cities of Mesopotamia, on the other side of the, Euphrates, River. The third part, of the Arab army, was sent to the east, against the kingdom of Iran. In that period the kingdom of Iran grew weaker, and their army was divided into three parts. Then the Ishmaelite troops who were gathered in the east, went and besieged Tesiphon, since the king of Iran resided there. Troops from the land of Media, Marats, some eighty thousand armed men under their general Rostam assembled and went against, the Arabs, in battle. Then, the Arabs, left the city and crossed to the other side of, 127, the Tigris River. The Iranians, also crossed the river, pursuing them. And they did not stop until they reached their borders, at the village called Hurtishan. The Arabs, continued to pursue them, eventually, going and encamping in the plain. Present were Mushim Mamikonian, son of Darwit, the general of Armenia with three thousand armed men, and also Prince Gregor, lord of Syonic, with one thousand men. The Iranian and Arab armies, attacked each other, and the Iranian forces fled before them. But, the Arabs, pursued them, putting them to the sword. All the principal Naxaraz died, as did General Rostam. They killed Mushir and two of his sister's sons, as well as Gregor, the lord of Syonic, along with one son. Some, of the Iranian troops, escaped and fled back to their own land. The remnants of the Iranian forces assembled in Atratakan at one spot and made Zahoxaz at their general. Then they hurried to Tesiphon and took the treasury of the, G107, kingdom, the inhabitants of the cities, and their king, and then hurried to get back to Atratakan. But as soon as they had departed and gone some distance, the Ishmaelite army unexpectedly came upon them. Horrified, the Iranians, abandoned the treasury and the inhabitants of the city, and fled. Their king also fled, winding up with the southern troops. Now, the Arabs, took the entire treasury and returned to Tesiphon, taking the inhabitants of the cities along too. 128, and they pillaged the entire country. The venerable Heraclius ended his life in ripe old age. He reigned for thirty years, 610 to 4041. Heraclius, made his son Constantine swear to have clemency upon all those transgressors whom he had ordered exiled. He made him vow to send each back to his place, and to bring back the aspect, his wife and son, and to establish him in his former rank. Should he want to go to his land, as I have sworn, and may my oath not be false, release him, and let him go in peace. Heraclius died and his son Constantine ruled. But no one was chosen as general of the land of Armenia, since the princes were disunited and quit each other's presence. The polluting army, of the Arabs, arose from Asoristan and came through the valley route to the land of Taran. They took, Taran, Znunik and Agiovit and then, going to the Bukri valley via Ordsboy and Gogovit, poured into Erit. None of the Armenian troops was able to carry the bad news to the Awan of Dwin. There were, however, three of the princes who went and gathered the dispersed troops, 
Teodoros Vahuyuni, 129, Zaki Ahawagian, and Shapu Amachuni. They fled to Dwin, reached the Metsama Bridge, crossed it, destroyed it, and then they went to take the bad news to the Awan. All the people of the land had assembled in the fortress, and they had come in harvest time for the vineyards. Theodoros went to the city of Naxjawan. The enemy Busha reached Metsamor Bridge but was unable to cross over, G-108. However, the Arabs, had as a guide Vardik, Prince of Mok, who was called Aknik, Little Eyes. Crossing the Metsamor Bridge, they raided the entire country. They accumulated a very great amount of loot and captives, then came and encamped by the edge of the Zosrakat forest. On the fifth day, of the Arab sojourn, on a Friday, the thirtieth of the month of Trey, Trey, the fourth month in the Armenian calendar, November, they came against the city, of Duin, and it was betrayed into their hands. For they set fires here and there, and drove away the guards on the wall by smoke and by shooting arrows. They then erected ladders, scaled the wall and, once inside, opened the city gates. The army of the enemy poured inside and put most of the city to the sword. Then, taking the loot and booty of the city, they departed and encamped at their same campsite. After passing some days there, they arose and departed by the same route they had come. They had a multitude of captives with them, some, 130, 35,000 souls. Now the prince of Armenia, the lord of Rishtanik, who had been concealed in an ambuscade in the district of Gogovit, went against, the Arabs, with few troops. But he was unable to resist, and so fled before them. The Arabs, pursued, Rishtunik's troops, killing many of them. Then they went to Asoristan. This occurred in the days of Katagikos Ezu. As a result of that battle, an order came from the emperor, granting, the military command and the dignity of patrician to Teodoros, lord of Rishtunik. All this took place as a result of Katagiko's nurses who succeeded Ezra on the Katagikosal throne. When the sons of Ishmael had arisen and issued from the desert of Sinai, their king Amr, Umar, did not accompany them. But when, the Arabs, had militarily rooted both kingdoms, seizing from Egypt to the great Taurus mountain, from the western sea, the Atlantic Ocean, to Media and Zuzastan, they then emerged with the royal army, and went, to the, G-109, natural borders of the holdings of Ishmael. Then the, Arab, 131, king gave an order to assemble boats and many sailors and to navigate southwardly, going east to Pars, to Sagastan, to Zind, to Sman, to the land of Turan and to Makuran as far as the borders of India. The troops swiftly prepared and implemented the command. They burned every country, taking loot and booty. They then turned and made expeditions on the waves of the sea, and reached their own places. We heard this, account, from men, who had returned, from captivity in Zuzast and Tashkastan, who themselves had been eyewitnesses to the events described and narrated them to us. Chapter 31. Regarding the Jews and their wicked plans. Now I shall speak about the plot of the Jewish rebels, who, finding support from the Hagarenes for a short time, planned to, rebuild the Temple of Solomon. Locating the place called the Holy of Holies, they constructed, the temple, with a pedestal, to serve as their place of prayer. But the Ishmaelites envied, the Jews, expelled them from the place, and named the same building their own place of prayer. The Jews, built a temple for their worship, elsewhere. It, 132, was then that they came up with an evil plan, they wanted to fill Jerusalem with blood from end to end, and to exterminate all the Christians of Jerusalem. Now it happened that there was a certain grandee Ishmaelite, who went to worship in their private place of prayer. He encountered three of the principal Jewish men, who had just slaughtered two pigs and taken and put them, in the Muslim, place of prayer. Blood, G-110, was running down the walls and on the floor of the building. As soon as the man saw them, he stopped and said something or other to them. They replied and departed. The man at once went inside to pray. He saw the wicked, sight, and quickly turned to catch the men. When he was unable to find them, he was silent and went to his place. Then many, Muslims, entered the place and saw the evil, and they spread a lament throughout the city. The Jews told the prince that the Christians had desecrated their place of prayer. The prince issued an order and all the Christians were gathered together. Just as they wanted to put them to the sword, the man came and addressed them, Why shed so much blood in vain? Order all the Jews to assemble, and I shall point out the guilty ones. As soon as they were all assembled and, the man, 
walked among them, he recognized the three men whom he had previously, 133, encountered. Seizing them, the Arabs, tried them with great severity until they disclosed the plot. And because their prince was among the Jews present, the Arab prince, ordered that six of the principals involved in the plot be killed. He permitted the other, Jews, to return to their places. Chapter 32 Constantine dies as a result of his mother's plot, and Heraclius, son of Heraclius by his second wife, is enthroned. General Vagentin, Valentinian, comes to Constantinople and enthrones Constantine's son, Costas. The Iranians war with the Ishmaelites and are defeated. Aspet Verasteroth returns from court, and dies. The Ishmaelites come to Atratakan, and divide into three wings they take Artsbu fortress, campaigning against the Safakan Gund. When Heraclius died, his son Constantine ruled. The latter, appointed Vagentianos, called an Arsacid, as the general of his troops. He ordered his troops to go to the east, G111. Constantine ruled only a few days before dying in the plot of his mother Martina, Heraclius' wife. Heraclius' son, Heracleonas, born of the Augusta Martina, was then enthroned, 638 to 641. 134. Constantine had been Heraclius' son by his first wife. Taking the initiative, Vagentin went against him at Constantinople with his troops. He captured Martina, cut off her tongue, and then killed her with her two sons. They enthroned Constantine's son, Constans, too, 641-668, calling him after his father's name. Constans personally assembled the troops and went to the east. During the first year of the reign of the Byzantine Emperor Constans, and in the tenth year of the Iranian King Yazgut, 641-642, the Iranians assembled 60,000 armed men to war with the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites fought them with 40,000 swordsmen, clashing in the district of Mark. The battle lasted for three days until the foot soldiers on both sides were reduced. Suddenly the Iranian troops were informed that an auxiliary force had come to help the Ishmaelites. The Iranians fled from camp all through the night. The remnants of the Ishmaelite troops went against them in the morning, but found no one in the camp. So they raided across the face of the entire country, putting man and beast to the sword. They captured twenty-two fortresses and killed everything alive in them. But who can relate the incredible disasters inflicted by the brigand Ishmael who whipped up sea and land? The prophet, 135, Daniel long ago prophesied that such difficulties would come upon the earth. He spoke of, the four beasts which represent the four kingdoms which arose on the earth. The first was the western kingdom, which is Byzantium, represented by a human-like beast. Its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground, he said that this was diabolical idolatry. And it stood erect, as a man, and it was given a human heart. Behold, the second beast resembles a bear. It is, G112, in the east and is called the Sasanian kingdom. And the bear had three ribs in its mouth, the kingdom of Persians, Medes and Parthians, and they said to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Everyone knows how it ate. Now the third beast was like a leopard with four wings of a bird, and possessing four heads. The winged leopard, represents the northern kingdom, Gog and Magog and their two comrades to whom had been given authority to fly in a force to the north. Now the fourth beast was awesome and dreadful with teeth of iron, and claws of copper. It would eat and devour then stomp the residue with its feet. This fourth emerged from the south and represents the Ishmaelite kingdom as the chief of the angels said, the fourth beast will come to possess a kingdom greater than any kingdom, and will devour the entire world. And from the ten horns, ten kings will arise but after them yet another shall arise who in wickedness, 136, will surpass all the previous ones, Daniel 7. In the second year of the venerable Heraclius' grandson Constans' reign, Vagentin planned to deceive the Senate through rhetoric and to personally acquire the throne, such that by crowning him, he would do what he wanted with his military command. He made the yoke of service weigh heavy on the inhabitants of the city, having as his support the three thousand armed troops which he had brought with him and numerous other troops which had joined him. It was then that the men of the city gathered together before the Patriarch, in the Holy Church of God, and told him that, they wanted to, eliminate the weight of their service. They sent to Vagentin, telling him, to abolish their service, but he did not want to hear it. Now there was a certain one of the princes present, named Antoninos, who said to Vagentin, What is their alliance, what is their plot? Besides, 
how could they dare to send you such a message? But if you command, I shall go and destroy their alliance and plot, and shall chase each one back to his place, that your, G-113, 137, will be done. Vague Entin, responded, go and do as you said, Antoninos, arose and departed with a thousand men. As soon as he entered the church he began severely beating the principals. At this, the patriarch rose to his feet and said, It is too much, and unjust to do what you are doing here. Anton attacked him and slapped him on the jaw, saying, Go to your place. Then the mob became agitated and attacked, Antoninos, seizing him and dragging him through the city by his feet. After this they set him on fire. Vagentin was informed, and he was seized with trembling. Just then the mob poured in upon him, dragged him beyond the houses, beheaded him, and then took, the corpse, to the same place where they had burned Antoninos, and burned that too. Then they confirmed Constans on the throne of the empire. They made Theodoros, a certain one of the loyal princes of Armenia, the general over those in the Byzantine sector. As soon as, Theodoros, took the military command, he beseeched the emperor as a favor to have clemency on those, people, who had been exiled to Africa, especially on, 138, Aspet, son of Sembat called Zerof Shum. God made the emperor's heart mild, and he ordered that, the exiles, be brought to the capital. He received them as though they were beloved, personages, of the realm. He made, Aspets, son Sembat the first Spatharios among all the Spathroi, and a candidate. Thus, in the fifth year of his reign, he returned to the previous order. The emperor also had clemency on, Vahuns Exahuni and others besides. Constans, dispatched a certain prince named Tuma to Armenia. He arrived, and did not want to destroy the oath, existing, between the emperor and the prince of Mark. He united all the princes and took them with him to the prince of Mark. He spoke with him about peace. And he received many goods from him and promised with an oath that he would have Theodoros sent to the palace bound, since he was the prince of the land of Armenia. He then returned to the Armenian troops. As soon as, Tuma, reached the Kotate country, his men, suddenly fell upon, Theodoros, seized, bound, and had him sent before the emperor. Now when Emperor Constans heard of this, he was exceedingly wroth, for he had not ordered that, G-114, Theodoros, be bound. He commanded that he be released from bonds, and that the document accusing him be read. When, Constanzo learned what the treachery really was he ordered, 139, that, Theodoros, be summoned to his presence. Constans, received him with affection and with the honor due to his authority he arranged a stipend and funds for upkeep from the treasury. He then commanded that Tuma be summoned, but he did not order him to enter the court. Rather, the examination was conducted outside, the chamber. Lord Theodoros Rishtuni was vindicated in his testimony and justice was done to him. Tuma was discredited and dropped from honor. It was at this time that Aspet, Bagratuni, and Theodoros, Lord of Rishtunik, saw each other, again, and shed tears upon each other's necks. For they had been nourished together at the court of Zerof, king of Iran. But Aspet could not be reconciled with Byzantine rule, instead he plotted treachery. He requested an order from Emperor Constan so that, Aspet, could dispatch four men of his family to Armenia to bring him some things. The emperor commanded that the order be issued to him. Now, Aspet, disguised himself, took along three other men, reached the shore and showed the imperial order. He boarded a ship and quickly crossed the sea, resembling a bird, and soon reached Teke where he fortified himself. The people of Teke received him with delight. In this period there was no small amount of turbulence in the land of Armenia, for a royal command arrived for the, 140, general of Armenia to hold all the passes of the roads and to search the land's fortresses. Then it became known that, Aspet, had returned and was fortified in Teke, Armenia. Then the Byzantine general, Theodoros, together with the princes of the army and the Naxaras of Armenia ordered that Katagiko's nurses should be sent to Aspet and vow to him, their, loyalty in requesting that the authority of the land be given to him, and that his wife and children be sent back to him. The Katagikos went and made an oath with, Aspet, so that he would not depart. Then, the Katagikos returned. They wrote to Emperor Constans to treat, Aspet, according to, G-115, the oath he had promised. For Aspet had written to the Emperor, saying, I am your servant and shall not leave your service. However, because some people told me you will return to, the service of the country, 
whence you came, I became frightened and fled. But now, if I am considered worthy, I shall serve you loyally and give my life for your piety. Emperor Constans ordered that, Aspet, be made Curo Pallet, that he be given a crown of honor and the authority of the land. He further ordered that, Aspet's, wife and children be sent back with great splendor. He had, Aspet, given silver thrones and other very great gifts. 141, yet, before the Hravatak arrived, before he was honored with the dignity of Curo Pallet, Aspet, became ill and died. They took his body and buried it near his father's, at Duryunk. The emperor established, Aspet's, eldest son, who was named Smat, in his father's dignity, giving him the authority of the Aspetushman of his native Tenutidum. The emperor, made, Smat, Drungarius, Drunga, of his troops, and gave him a wife from the Arshakoni house, one of his relatives, and dispatched him to the army, to his troops. After this, the emperor, sent Theodoros, lord of Rishtunic back to Armenia with great honor, giving him the same authority of military command, as he held before whether or not the princes of Armenia wanted it. He came and was established in the same authority. The next year, the Ishmaelite army came to Atrata Khan where it divided into three parts. One division went to Eret, another, to the September Hak in Gundaria, and the third to Abania slash Aguania. Those who went to the September Hak in Gundaria spread out raiding, putting all of those parts to the sword, and taking booty and captives. They came and assembled at, 142, Eruan, the Iberian edition has Hiruan. See Iberian, p.314 n. 512, where he speculates that the original text read her eu and, and referred to the district of her. They battled with the fortress, but were unable to take it. They went to Ordsboy and were unable to take it. So they departed, encamping across from the fortress of Artsap, near the water. The Arabs, began warring with the fortress, and suffered no small amount of injury from those inside. Now there was a, secret, way out of the fortress from the rear leading in the direction of Asoran. This, G116, was called Kaxnikdutz. Now some men thus descended from the fortress, to go to request an auxiliary force from Daron Fortress. And Smat Bagratuni gave them his son, Vraz Sahak, with forty men. Going at night time, they ascended to the fortress, not taking care, to conceal, the place. The Ishmaelites found the place and entered the fortress by the very same path. Before dawn they had seized the place. They came across ten guards asleep, whom they killed. Chapter 33 The Lord frees the captives and destroys the Ishmaelites. Those, Arabs, who had spread out raiding at Eret Strike Take, Iberia slash Georgia, and Abania slash Aguania. The naval battle between the Ishmaelites and the Byzantines. Procopius, Procop, goes to Muawiya, Muawiya, prince of the Ishmaelites, 143, and the peace between, the Arabs, and Byzantines. The deeds of Katagiko's nurses. The dispute over faith with the Armenians. The Armenians reply to Emperor Constans. In the second year of Constans, reign, on a Sunday, the twenty-third of the month of Hurry, Hurry, the second month of the movable Armenian calendar, the Ishmaelites shrieked before and behind the fortress and put, the inhabitants, to the sword. Many were thrown from the height and were killed. After lowering the women and children from the fortress, they wanted to kill them. There was no counting the captives, and there were an extremely great number of cattle, which they seized. But at dawn the next day the general of Armenia came upon them and visited inconceivable destruction on them. Now they were three thousand select armed men, drawn from all the Ishmaelite forces, but, virtually, none of them escaped. A few, however, fled on foot, and secured themselves in Champ, Swamp. On that day, the Lord spared the multitude of captives from the Ishmaelites, and greatly destroyed Ishmael. Two Ishmaelite princes, Uthman, Ortman, and Ogome, Abgarian, Ogbe, p. 317n. 523, died. Great was the triumph of the general of Armenia, and the latter sent to Constans gifts from the booty, one hundred of the most, one hundred and forty-four, select horses. The emperor and the entire palace were pleased, and, Constans, sent great thanks, to Theodoros. Now that, Arab, army which was in the Eretian region put to the sword areas as far as Teke, Iberia, and Abania slash Agawania. 
they took booty and captives and passed on to Naxchawan, where the other division was battling to take the fortress of Naxchawan. However, they were unable to take it. They took the fortress of Zrum, killing, the men, and taking the women and children captive. Now the, Arab general, who was in the Palestine area, ordered that a large naval fleet be organized. He boarded a ship, and began warring with Constantinople. But his naval battle did not succeed, for a multitude of, Byzantine, troops in boats came up before him, and sent, the Arabs, to the deep, driving off many others with fire, and pursuing those who fled. Nonetheless, Emperor Constans was horrified, by the attack, and considered it wise to pay a tax slash tribute, sack, and to make peace by means of messengers. The Ishmaelites hurried the Byzantines to complete a peace agreement. Now, 145, Constans, the Byzantine emperor, because he was a lad, did not dare to do so without the approval of the army. So he wrote to Procopius for him to go with him to Damascus, to see Muawiyah, prince of the Ishmaelite army, in order to make the terms of the agreement in accordance with the desires of the troops. As soon as Procopius saw the imperial order and learned about matters from the troops, he went with them to Damascus to Muawiyah, prince of the Ishmaelite army. He revealed the amount of the tribute, stated the limit, made peace, and departed. At that time nurses, Katagikos of Armenia, decided to build a dwelling for himself close by the holy churches in the city of Vaghashapat, by the road where it is said King Trivat went before St. Gregory. Nurses, also built, G118, a church there named after the divine Svartnots, joyous ones, the multitude of heavenly soldiers who appeared in the vision of St. Gregory. He built a lofty structure of stunning beauty worthy of the divine honor to which it was dedicated. Nurses, led, the course of, a river, near to the church, he had all the stony areas worked on, and then planted vineyards and trees. To the glory of God, he ordered that a lofty wall be constructed, which by its, 146, beautiful design blended with nature. But that rebellious dragon did not cease and instead out of its cunning, wanted to war with God. It strove to bring persecution upon the churches of the land of the Armenians. For in the time of Heraclius' grandson, Emperor Constans, it started working the guile of its wickedness taking as satellites those troops stationed on Byzantine, Armenian, land. Now the Armenians never accepted the Roman communion of the body and blood of the Lord. The soldiers, wrote a letter of complaint to the Byzantine Emperor Constans and to the Patriarch, saying, We are regarded as infidels in this land. For, the people here, are disrespectful toward Christ God's council of Chalcedon and the tome of Leo, and they anathematize them. Then the emperor and the patriarch ordered that an edict be written to the Armenians telling them to unite with the faith of the Romans and not to despise the council or the tome. Now there was, in Constantinople, a man named Darwit from the village of Bagrawan who had studied the art of philosophy. Constans, ordered that he be dispatched to Armenia to eliminate the opposition. All the bishops and Naxaras of Armenia assembled in Duin by the Christ-loving Katagikos, nurses, and the pious general of Armenia, Theodoros, Lord of Rishtunik. They saw the emperor's, 147, order, and listened to the philosopher who taught the division of the Trinity according to the Tome of Leo. Having heard this, they did not agree to replace the correct doctrine of St. Gregory with the Tome of Leo. All were inclined to, g. 119, give a written reply. The following is, a copy of the reply to the letter sent to Armenia by Constans, Emperor of Rome, written by the bishops of Armenia, Katagikos nurses, the Naxaras and General Theodoros, Lord of Rishtunik. A true and orthodox Nicene letter. I beseech those of you who hold the God-loving Christian faith to read this. We have the command of the caring prophets and apostles of Christ to make beseeching prayers for your God-loving realm, for all the princes, troops, and pious palace officials, wherein the love of God reposes and the signs of divine favor are apparent. For behold, you possess, a kingdom greater and stronger, 148, than all others, which was crowned not by human hands but by the right hand of God, which nothing except Christ's kingdom can equal. By the grace of God the same is true of, your, patriarchate. The Naxaras and Christ-loving troops, and we glory in the light of your God-loving kingdom, were unmoved by the wicked and impious Iranian kings. For when they abolished the kingdom, and destroyed all the troops of the land of Armenia taking men and women into captivity, brandishing swords at the survivors and trying to convert, us, to fanaticism, they were unable to do so. Indeed, the infidels were yet more embarrassed in their folly, 
Psalms 24. So matters continued, until King Kawad and his son Ziroph ordered that each individual should adhere to his own faith and no one should dare harass the Armenians. All are physically our servants, but as for spiritual matters, he who judges souls knows about them. Then there was Ormazd's son Ziroph who, g. 120, after capturing Jerusalem, ordered all the bishops of the east and of Asoristan to assemble at court. He said to them, I hear that both sides are Christians yet that one group anathematizes the other. What do they regard as just? Now, 149, let them come together at the royal court so that what is correct will be confirmed, and what is false will be rejected. So all the bishops and priests and believers in those parts assembled, and, the king, established as their Ostakan Smat Bagratuni, who was called Zerofshnam, and the chief physician of the court. Present were the patriarch Zakaria of Jerusalem who was in captivity and many other philosophers who were captured from the city of Alexandria. King Zeroth ordered them to proceed with justice and to acquaint him with the truth. All of them assembled in the royal hall, and there was a commotion. For some were of the orthodox faith, possessing, documents with the seals of ancient kings. Others were Nestorians, while many others were the rabble. The patriarch even came forward and said, Let that man not be called God, and the king was informed. The king responded, By whose command has he come here? Let him be beaten and have him depart. He also ordered that the multitude of sectarians be removed from the Etian. He ordered that only the, beliefs of the, nations, Constantinopolitans, 150, Ephesians, and Chalcedonians should be examined. Now there were two bishops from the land of Armenia present, trustworthy men who had been dispatched, to Iran, because of the violence in the land, of Armenia. They were, Cumetas, bishop of the Mamikonians, and Mateos, bishop, of the Amatunic, and had arrived to inform the king. They had ready with them the document of St. Gregory. The king ordered that it be asked, during the reigns of which kings did those councils take place? And they replied, the Nicene council took place under Constantine, the council of, g. 121, Constantinople, under Theodosius the Great, Ephesus, under Theodosius the Less, and Chalcedon, under Martian. The king replied, the orders of three kings seem more just than that of one king. Then the king started asking about Nestorius, wanting to know who he was, where he was from, at which council had he been present, and what he had said. Then he ordered that the Nestorians be removed from the Etian. Similarly he inquired about the council of Chalcedon, wanting to know who were its principles. They told him everything, saying, the heads of the councils of, Nicaea and Constantinople were emperors Constantine and Theodosius the Great themselves. The council of Ephesus was presided over by, 151, Cyril, bishop of Alexandria and Chalcedon, by bishop Theodoritos who was inclined toward Nestorius. Present, at this assembly, were, the cleric, called the Aaron Katagikos, and other bishops from Asoristan, Aruistan, Zuzastan, and other lands. King Zeroth ordered that if they did not turn from their heresies and walk the royal path, he would have all of their churches demolished, and have them put to the sword. He ordered that a tax be levied for the Chalcedonians, Iberians slash Georgians, and the Katagikos of Abania slash Agoania and many other bishops from the Byzantine area, and the princes who had come into the service of the Iranian king. Isk ork skikadon in eu zed vrats. Eu ish sank ork e keel in i zaha yushwan parzits taga warin, oruf eu chepai khan isk ramayates tal. However, he sought a contract from the two sides. He started to examine the council of Nicaea, which was convened by Constantine, of Constantinople, under Theodosius the Great, of Ephesus, under Theodosius the Less, and of Chalcedon, under Martian. When he was familiarized with everything justly and truthfully, he inquired, why is it that those three do not mention the division of, Christ's, 152, nature into two parts, as the others do? It is clear that even we must be divided in two, that, even, the king has two, rather than one, nature. For I, too, am of two natures, one from the father and one from the mother, one spiritual, one physical. However, the divinity which is not everywhere, g. 122, despite what it wants, cannot be everything or do everything. What is divinity? Then, Zeroth, ordered that Zakaria the patriarch of Jerusalem and the philosopher from the city of Alexandria be ordered to tell the truth under oath. They replied, We did not approach God wickedly nor did he visit his anger upon us wickedly. Now, Fearing God we shall speak the truth before you. 
The true faith is the one pronounced at Nicaea before the venerable Constantine. The councils of Constantinople and Ephesus were in accord with this as is the correct faith of the Armenians. The pronouncements of Chalcedon were not in accord with them, as your benevolence has learned. The king ordered that the treasury be examined and they found, in the treasury a copy, of the true Nicene creed and the confession of faith of the land of Armenia which was sealed with the ring of King Kawad and of his son Zeroff. And this king Zeroff ordered that all Christians under my authority should hold the faith of the Armenians. 153. Those uniting with the Armenians' faith were the Metropolitan Kamishov from Asoristan and ten other bishops, the God-loving Queen Shirin, Brave Smat, and the Great Chief Physician. King Zeroff ordered that a copy of the correct confession of faith be sealed with his ring and placed in the royal treasury. Now because God removed us from serving the authority of darkness and made us worthy of your divine kingdom how much more ought we to beseech Christ God that your pious and God-loving kingdom remain unshaken for eternity, that days on earth be as days in heaven filled with much triumph, ruling the entire world, land and sea. For although physically you are of the, g. 123, human race, Nonetheless you sit on a divine throne and your God-loving kingdom is filled with the light of glory which shines down upon all, you who are crowned from on high, the pride of all Christians, with the strength of the divine cross. You resemble the God-loving, pious, God-favored, brave, triumphant, salvation-working, blessed Heraclius, your father, who saved all countries from the bitter executioner. May Christ God grant you the same because of your piety. There follows a lengthy discussion of doctrinal matters, which we omit. The translation resumes with chapter 34 Grabar p. 135. 154 chapter 34. The attack of the Hagarenes, and events in Rome. Once again I shall speak about the evil which befell us in our time, regarding how the veil of ancient faith was torn, and how that death-bringing dry heat breathed upon us and scorched the tall, beautiful, leafy trees of our tender orchards. And this is the truth for we sinned against the Lord and angered the saint of Israel. Should it please you to heed me, he said, you shall take the land's goodness. But should you wish not to listen, the sword shall devour you, for this was uttered by the mouth of the Lord. This same whirlwind was seen above Babylon and then reached every country. For Babylon is the mother of all nations and its realm, the kingdom of the north. Now further south of them, namely, the Indians and the peoples dwelling in the great desert were the disowned sons of Abraham, born of Hagar and Keturah, Ishmael, Amram, Mogan, Madian, Yigzan, Yezbok, and Melissor. And the sons of Lot were Amon and Muvab, and those of Esau were Edom, and there were others yet, who dwelt to the north of the southern Indians in the enormous and vast desert, being, disowned, 155, by Moses and the children of Israel. The prophet said about them, They are, as a storm which comes moving from the south, from the terrible desert. That is the large and terrible desert, I mentioned, from which came that whirlwind of peoples, arising as a storm, and seizing and trampling every country. And the saying was fulfilled, that the fourth beast will create a fourth kingdom upon the earth, more wicked than all other kingdoms, which will make a desert of every country, g. 135. Now what shall I say about the agitation and calamitous disasters taking place within the empire of the Romans, the empire, which never ceased its internecine warfare? The principal men and advisers of the realm were drowned in blood, since it is said, they were plotting the emperor's death. As a result, all the principal men and the princes of the empire were destroyed and the inhabitants of the land were reduced, until there was no advisor to be found. Among those, killed were Georg Magistros and that virtuous man, Manuel, who was the father-in-law of Aspet Smat, son of Smat the Great, called Zerof Shum. Some say that they observed a glowing light at the place where he was killed. Smbat was exiled. For the troops accused him of trying to rebel afterwards. They told the emperor that, Smbat had said, the, 156, Magistro's blood must be avenged. He was a prince of the army there, and liked by all the troops. Smbat was prince of the Thracian prince's troops, while Manuel was a Magistro's working in Constantinople. Now the emperor did not summon the Magistro's with bold authority, since he feared a rebellion of the troops. Rather, he summoned the Aspet Smbat and made him swear by the Lord's cross, which he possessed, that he would divulge nothing. Then the emperor sent, Smbat, back to his troops to speak to the magistros in peace, but to deceive him and bring him, into captivity. Now, Smbat, went but was unable to deceive him, especially since he did not conceal, the emperor's, 
words. Then he spoke with all the princes of the army and gave, the magistros, the imperial order. Since they and all the troops were unable to resist the imperial order, they gave him into their hands. They seized and bound him and took him into the emperor's presence as a result, the troops of the Thracian princes plotted, smats, death and said that he was planning to rebel, so that he would be put to death. However, the emperor rejected them and spared, smat, g136. Chapter 35. The Ishmaelites war with the Iranians and destroy their lordship. The death of Yaskut. The Medes and the Armenians enter the service of the Hagarenes. Constans comes to Armenia. The Ishmaelites prepare, to fight, with the Byzantines. Regarding nurses, Katagikos of Armenia. In the twentieth year of King Yaskut of Iran, AD 652, in the eleventh year of Emperor Constans, who was called Constantine after his father, in the nineteenth year of the lordship of the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelite army which was in the country of Iran and Zuzastan went eastward to the area known as the Palhor country, which is the land of the Parthians, against Yaskut, king of Iran. Yaskut fled from them, but was unable to escape, because, the Arabs, caught up with him close to the Kushan's borders, and destroyed all of his troops. Yaskut, fled to the army of the Tetels who had come from different areas to help him. Then there was the Marat's prince, about whom I spoke earlier. He had gone to the east to their king, rebelled, fortifying himself in one place, requested an oath from the Ishmaelites, and went to the desert to serve the Ishmaelites. Now the Tetel troops seized Yaskut and killed him. He had reigned for twenty years. And so ended the lordship of the Iranians and, 158, the house of Sasan, which had ruled for 642 years. When the king of the Ishmaelites saw the success of these victories, and that he had done away with the kingdom of Iran, he became confident, and when three years of the peace provision had passed, the Arab caliph, no longer wanted to continue the peace with the Byzantine emperor. So he ordered his troops to commence warfare on land and sea, to do away with this kingdom as well, in the twelfth year of the reign of Constans, g. 137. In the same year the Armenians rebelled, withdrawing from the Byzantine Empire, and entering the service of the Ishmaelite king. Theodoros, lord of Rishtunik and all the princes of Armenia made an oath until death, and an agreement, lasting, until the grave to break the divine harmony, between Armenia and Byzantium. The Ishmaelite prince spoke with them as follows, Let this be an oath of peace between myself and you, lasting, as many years as you wish. I shall not take tribute, sack, from you for three years after which, by oath, you may pay what you wish. You may keep fifteen thousand cavalry in your land. Provide sustenance from your land, and I shall include it in the royal tax. I shall, 159, not demand that the, Armenian, cavalry be sent to Syria though let it be ready to go and fight wherever else I order it. I shall send no emirs to, your, fortresses, nor even a single Arab officer or cavalryman. Let no enemy enter Armenia, but should the Byzantines come against you, I shall dispatch as large an auxiliary force as you want. And I swear by God the Great that I shall not break this vow. Thus did the satellite of the Antichrist pull, the Armenians, away from the Byzantines, this section, unlike the major portion of the book uses Homets, Romans, instead of Units, Greeks, for the Byzantine Empire. For although the Emperor wrote them many requests and entreaties and summoned them, they did not want to listen to him. Then, the Emperor, said, I shall come to the city of Karin, and you should come to me. For I want to give you stipends in aid and plan together with you what we should do. Despite this, the Armenians, did not want to heed him. All the Byzantine troops complained and grumbled about the Lord of Rishtunik and about the Armenians before their emperor about the blows, inflicted, at Mardotsk. They said, the Armenians, have allied with the Ishmaelites. They made us trust them, encouraged the troops to go raiding to Atratakan, then had, the Arabs, attack us unexpectedly, 160, and defeat us. We left everything there. Now let us go to Armenia and get our things. Then Emperor Constans agreed to do the will of the troops. He took 100,000 of his troops and went to Armenia. As soon as he reached Durchin, Ishmaelites came before him, g. 138, and gave him a letter from their prince which said, Armenia is mine, so do not go there. But should you go, I will deal with you in such a way that you will be unable to flee. Now Emperor Konstan said, That land belongs to me, and I shall go there. Should you come against me, God will be the judge of what is just. 
And he went to the city of Karin in the twelfth year of his reign and in the twentieth year of the lordship of the Ishmaelites. The emperor Constans spent several days in the city of Karin slash Erzurum. The princes and troops from so-called Fourth Armenia came before him, as did all the troops and princes from that area who had separated from, the followers of, Prishtunik. Among them, were the Spritzik, the Bagretted princes, the Manaik, the Daranaik, those from the district of Eat-Keats, all the troops from those places, and the Karnatsik, Tayetsik and Basnatsik. Also coming into, Konstans, presence there were the princes of Vanand with their troops, 161, the Shirkatsik, Zorksahuni, men from the house of Dymaxon, Mushim Mamikonian with his people, certain other princes, troops from the Arat area, the Ahawagayank, Ahaniank Varanunik, Ntunik, Spandunik and others. Katagiko's nurses had come from Teke and visited, the emperor. All the princes told the emperor about the plan and desire of rebellion of the lord of Rishtunik and about the quick traffic of Ishmaelite emissaries going to see him. Then the emperor and all of his troops anathematized the lord of Rishtunik, removed him from the dignity of authority and dispatched another man in his place accompanied by forty men. When they reached, Theodoros, he had them seized and bound, sending some to the fortress of Bagesh and others to the islands in, Lake, Biznunik, Lake Van. Then he himself went to the island of Uktamar commanding the troops of those areas to go and secure themselves in their own districts. United with him were the Iberian slash Georgians, Abanian slash Aguanians and Sionetsik who, in accordance with his order, went to their own lands and fortified themselves there. Now Theodoros, lord of Vawanik, seized Arpa fortress. His son, Grigor, was the son-in-law of the lord of Rishtunik, g. 139. For as Nursa Dashkari secured himself out in the open and seized the treasury, since all the treasures, 162, of the land, the church, the princes, and merchants were there. Now as soon as Emperor Constans heard about this, he wanted to loot the multitude of the troops and to go and winter in Armenia, in order to destroy the country. But then the Katagikos Musha and all the princes prostrated themselves and with great and tearful entreaties asked for clemency so that, Constans, not become totally enraged because of their offences and destroy the country. The emperor heeded their requests and released the multitude of troops. Then he himself went to Eret with twenty thousand troops and to Dwin where he resided in the home of the Katagikos. The emperor made Musha lord of the Mamikonians, prince of the Armenian cavalry and dispatched him with three thousand men to the area of the Safakan Gund. Likewise, he sent some of his troops to Iberia, Abania, and Siamnik to destroy their alliance. Other troops invested the area around the emperor, in the mountains and plains. While for some time they did not want to submit, later on they did go into, imperial, service. However, those, in Abania, Simonic, and the Safakan Gund, area, did not submit. Imperial troops, looted their country, taking whatever they found, and then returning to the king. 163 Regarding the Armenian Katagikos nurses now I shall relate a few things about Armenia's Katagiko's nurses. He was originally from the village of Ishkson in Teke. From childhood he was raised on Byzantine land, had learned the language of the Romans, and circulated about the land as a member of the military. He had accepted the council of Chalcedon and the tome of Leo. He did not reveal, g. 140, his plans of impiety to anyone until he reached, the office of, the episcopacy of the land. Subsequently he was called to the Katagikosal throne. He was a man of virtuous behavior, of fasts and prayers. But within his heart was concealed the poison of bitterness, he planned to make the Armenians accept the council of Chalcedon, but did not dare to do anything about it until Emperor Constans came and stayed at the home of the Katagikos and on Sunday preached the council of Chalcedon in the church of St. Gregory. The mass was offered in Latin by a Roman priest, and the emperor, the Katagikos, and all the bishops took communion those who wanted to and those who did not. Thus did the Katagikos shake the true faith of St. Gregory which all, previous, Katagikoi had held firmly in the Holy Church, from, the time of, 164, St. Gregory to this day. And, nurses, fouled the limpid, clear waters of the fountains, a plan, which he had in mind for a long time, but which he dared not to reveal until that day. But when the time was right, he worked his will, betraying the bishops one by one, and disheartening them with terror. He threatened them, to the point that all of them carried out the command to commune under fear of death. They communed, even more so because, their mentors, the venerable and most fundamental, bishops, had died. 
but a certain bishop silenced and countered the emperor in his presence. Earlier all the bishops had subscribed with him and he had cursed the council of Chalcedon and the tome of Leo and rejected communion with Byzantium. This was sealed with the ring of the Catagicos, and the rings of all the bishops and grandee princes. They gave it to him to keep in the church. Now when mass was offered and all the bishops communed, the bishop whom I mentioned earlier, did not commune. Rather he descended from the bema and was hidden in the crowd. As soon as the ceremony of communion was finished, and the emperor entered, his, room, the catechicos and the Byzantine priest betrayed, the bishop, and made a complaint about him, saying, he did not sit on, his, throne and did, 165, not commune with us, regarding us and you unworthy. He left the bema and concealed himself in the crowd. The, G141, emperor became angry and ordered two men to go seize him and bring him to him in the room. When this was done, the emperor asked, Are you a priest? The bishop replied, If God and your glory so will it. The emperor said, And who are you that you regard neither me, your king, nor your catechicos and our father as worthy of communing with you? The bishop replied, I am a sinful, worthless man, and unworthy of communing with you, however, should God make me worthy of, communing with, you I would consider that I enjoyed, communion, with Christ at, his, table and from his hands. The emperor retorted, enough of that. Now tell me, is that the catechicos of Armenia, or not? The bishop answered, indeed, just as Saint Gregory was. The emperor asked, do you have that, respect, for the catechicos? Yes, he said. Will you take communion with him? The bishop answered, just as with Saint Gregory. The emperor asked, then why is it that you did not commune today? The bishop replied, Benevolent king, when we had but seen your image painted on the wall we were seized with trembling. Behold, how much more frightening it is, now, to see you face to face and to speak with you directly. We are ignorant benighted people who know, 166, neither, your, language nor, your, literature. But if we study first, we shall then master it. May your benevolent command rule by healing. He, the Katagikos, has gone beyond all the, religious, commands of this land. Four years ago he convened an assembly and all the bishops assembled here. He had a document regarding the faith made. Then he, I, and all the princes sealed this with our rings. That document is now with him. Order that it be sought and examined. And he was silent. The emperor realized his treachery and reprimanded him a great deal in his own language. The emperor then ordered, the bishop, to go and commune with the catechicos. As soon as the bishop fulfilled the emperor's order, he said, May God bless your benevolent and pious rule forever, and may you rule over all the seas and lands with much triumph. The emperor likewise blessed the bishop, G142, saying, May God bless you. You did what befits your wisdom, and I am thankful. The emperor hastened to Constantinople with great urgency, to reach it quickly. He departed in haste. He made a certain Morianos the prince of Armenia, and gave him, 167, an Armenian force which was from the area. Now when Emperor Constans left Duin, the Katagikos went with him. The Katagikos, went and stopped in Teke and did not return to his place, for the prince of Rishtunik and the other princes with him directed incredible rage at him. Now Theodoros, lord of Rishtunik, and his son-in-law, Hamazast, lord of the Mamakonians, were lying in ambush at the island of Ectamar. He requested troops from the Ishmaelites and seven thousand men came to his aid. He stationed them at Agiovit and Znunik, then he came and remained with them. When winter had passed and it was close to Great Easter, the Byzantines fled and went to Teke, but were expelled. They were unable to station themselves anywhere, but rather fled to the shores of the, Black, Sea, destroying the entire country. They captured the city of Trapizan amassing a great deal of loot, booty, and captives. After this, Theodoros, lord of Rishtunik, went to the Ishmaelite prince Muawiyah in Damascus and saw him with very great gifts. And the Ishmaelite prince gave him clothing made with gold and silver threads and a veil, or, banner, after their fashion. Muawiyah, gave, Theodoros, authority over Armenia, 168, Iberia, Abania slash Aguania, Simnik, as far as Capco and the Kora Gate, and released him with honor. Muawiyah, stipulated that he should bring that country into service. 
the breaking of the peace which had existed between Konstans and Muawiyah the Ishmaelite prince, took place in the eleventh year of Konstans reign. The king of the Ishmaelites ordered that all his troops should assemble in the west and make war on the Byzantine Empire, to take Constantinople and to eliminate yet another kingdom, g. 143. Chapter 36. The Letter of the Ishmaelite King to the Byzantine Emperor Constans. The Ishmaelite Prince Muawiyah comes to Chalcedon and is vanquished by the Lord. If you want to spend your life in peace, he wrote, abandon that foolish faith which you learned from childhood. Deny that Jesus and turn to the great God whom I worship, the God of our father Abraham. Send the multitude of your troops away from you, back to their own places. I shall make you a great prince in that region. I shall send Ostakans to your city, examine all the treasures, and order them divided into four parts. 169. Three parts will go to me, one part to you. I will give you as many troops as you need, and take as tribute as much as you are able to give. Otherwise, how can that Jesus whom you call Christ, who was unable to save himself from the Jews, possibly save you from me? All the troops in the east, in Iran, and Zuzastan, in the Indian area, from Aruastan and Egypt assembled by Muawiyah, prince of the army, who resided in Damascus. They readied military vessels at Alexandria and all the coastal cities and filled the boats with soldiers and, war, machinery. They had three hundred very large vessels with one thousand very select cavalrymen in each boat. Muawiyah, also ordered that five thousand light boats be made. Because of their light weight, he placed few men in them, one hundred men per ship, so that they swiftly glide over the waves of the sea surrounding the very large boats. Then, Muawiyah, dispatched them across the sea. He took the troops which were with him and went to Chalcedon. As he approached, all the inhabitants of every land submitted to him, the shore dwellers, mountain dwellers, and plains dwellers. Now the multitude of the G. 144, Byzantine troops went and entered Constantinople to guard the city. Meanwhile the corrupter, Muawiyah, entered Chalcedon in the thirteenth year of Constans. At the shore he had organized many light ships so that when the heavier boats reached Chalcedon he would quickly go to their aid. The Arabs, 170, had a letter from their king taken to Constans in the city. The emperor took the letter and entered the house of God. He prostrated himself and said, See, Lord, how these Hagarines insult you. Have mercy upon us, Lord, as we place our hopes in you. Shower them with contempt and avenge your name, Lord. Let them be kept in embarrassed confusion forever and be destroyed in shame. Let them learn that your name is Lord and you alone are high above every country. Constans, removed his crown and his purple robes and donned a hair shirt. He sat upon ashes and ordered that a fast be proclaimed in Constantinople after the fashion of Nineveh. Then behold, the large ships arrived at Chalcedon from the Alexandria area together with all the small ships and all their equipment. For they had equipped the boats with engines of war, shooting machines, rock-hurling machines, archers and slingers. They were designed, so that when they reached the city wall they would easily be able to go over the wall into the city, from the summits of the towers. When, the Arabs, were about two asparas distant from land, the dreadful power of the Lord was revealed. For the Lord, 171, made a sign and caused a violent wind to blow from heaven. The wind arose, turned into, a great storm, stirred the sea from the depths and rose to the surface creating waves as tall as the crests of lofty mountains. The wind which howled at them crashed and thundered like a storm cloud. The abyss gurgled and the towers fell, the machinery was destroyed, the ships were demolished, and the multitude of, G. 145, troops sank into the depths of the sea. The survivors were dispersed on planks, and, tossed about by the rising and falling of the waves, were killed. For the sea opened its mouth and swallowed them, and not a single one survived. That day, God with his arm raised, spared the city because of the prayers of the pious Emperor Constantine. The violence of the wind and the churning of the sea did not end for six days. When the Ishmaelites saw the dreadful power of the Lord, their hearts broke. Quitting Chalcedon at night, they returned to their own place. The other army which was stationed in the Cappadocia area made war on the Byzantine troops. The Byzantines struck them and then they fled to Aruastan, subjecting forth Armenia to looting. When fall had passed and winter was near, the Ishmaelite army came and, 172, encamped at Dwin. It planned to go and put Iberia slash Georgia to the sword. The Ishmaelite commander, communicated, with Iberia, 
by means of a threatening message which said, either you enter our service, or you leave the country and depart. But, the Iberians, did not accept this. Rather, they prepared to resist them in war. The Ishmaelites went against them to make war and to extirpate them completely. Now when they were on the road, cold and the snow of winter fell on them. As a result, they hastily departed for Asoristan, and did not work injustice in Armenia. Then the princes of Armenia who were in the Byzantine and the Arab sections, Hamazasp and Musha and all the others, came together in one place and united, making peace with each other so that the sword and bloodshed not appear in their midst, so that they pass the winter in peace, and spare the Shina Khans, peasants. For the lord of Rishtunik had fallen ill and had gone to the island of Agtamar, and was unable to go out or to think of anything. The princes, divided, g. 146, the country on the basis of the number of cavalrymen each, prince had, and established taxes in gold and silver. One could observe there the misfortunes of doubt similar, 173, to the, reactions, of a sick person when the pain grows severe and he cannot speak. Such things occurred. For there was nowhere for a man to flee to and hide, nor was he protected from within. Rather, he resembled someone who had fallen into the sea, and was unable to find a way out. Now when the lord of Rishtanik saw this, he requested troops from the Ishmaelites to strike and persecute Armenia, and to put Iberia to the sword. Chapter 37 The Medes Rebel from the Ishmaelites In that year the Medes rebelled from Ishmaelite service and killed the Ishmaelite king's prince, in charge, of taxation. They took refuge in the strongholds of the land of Medes, the deep forests, the chasms, rocky places, the troublesome deep valleys which are by the Gaz River and Marit's mountain, and, they took refuge, in the might of the vigorous and brave peoples dwelling in them, Delm and Delam, Agarian, p. 360n.653 amends this to Jegn and Delam and takes it as a reference to the peoples of Gilan and Delam, by the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. 174, for they were unable to bear the bitter and harsh service and the weight of the tax which had been imposed on them. Each year 365 sacks of money were taken from them. From those who could not pay they took a man for each dram and eliminated the cavalry and the principality of the land. For such reasons they placed their lives in the balance and one out of two thought it better either to die, or to be freed from that wicked service. They started, g. 147, to assemble the remaining people into an army and to organize by brigade so that perhaps they might escape the dragon's teeth and the bitter breath of the beast. Now the multitude of the Ishmaelite troops saw that their work was not succeeding in the region of the secure Marit's mountains. For they had not even been able to subjugate the Ketras and Skibte with all the multitude, staying, in secure places. Many, Arabs, lost their lives at the strongholds, falling headlong into the deep valleys. Many were pierced by arrows in the rough thorn patches, arrows, shot by brave, manly warriors. The Arabs, fled the place heading north toward the people who dwell by the Caspian gates. They reached the Kora Pass, crossed it, and destroyed all parts of the land by the foot of the mountain. A small force resisted them, 175, at a place, called the Gate of the Huns and struck at them, for they were the defenders of the place. Another army arrived from the Tetel area and the two armies clashed with great violence. The Ishmaelite army was defeated by the Tetel army which struck at them and put them to the sword. Now the survivors were not able to flee through the pass since another Tetel army had come to assist the first army. So, the Arabs, headed for the great and rugged Mount Caucasus. Barely going over a side of the mountain, a few, Arabs, escaped by a hairbreadth, naked, barefoot, on foot, and wounded. Thus did they go to the Tessiphon area, to the country of their habitation, g. 148. Chapter 38 Musha rebels from the Byzantines and enters the Ishmaelites' service. The battle of the Ishmaelites with the Byzantines at Naxchawan, the destruction of the Byzantines and the destruction of Armenia. Once more the Armenians quit Ishmaelite service and submit to the Byzantines. Hamazasp, lord of the Mamikonian, becomes Kuropalat, as a result of which the Ishmaelites kill the hostages. Discord breaks out among the Ishmaelite army and they separate from each other. Their prince Muawiya conquers all of them becomes king, and makes peace among them. Now Moshe, lord of the Mamikonians, rebelled in the, 176, Byzantine area and entered Ishmaelite service. And in that same year the Ishmaelite army which was in the land of Armenia seized the entire country from end to end. Theodoros, lord of Rishtanik, 
and all the princes of the land united and entered, Arab, service, hastening to do their bidding in every way, for fear of a terrible death hung over them. In that year the venerable and pious man Artawaz Dimaxian was betrayed by a jealous brother and delivered up to the merciless executioner named General Habib, who resided at Ashnak, Arak. He put, Artawaz, to a very cruel death. Now it was extremely cold winter and the Byzantines were harassing them. But because of the cold, the Arabs, were unable to engage them in war. Instead, they arose unexpectedly, crossed the river, and went and fortified themselves at Zari Harwan. When the Byzantines saw this, they did not concern themselves about them, but rather destroyed the fortress of Dwin, went to Naxchawan and fought with the fortress so that they might destroy it too. The general of the Byzantine army was a certain Morianos who was said to be a trustworthy man. 177. When spring arrived, the army, was organized and ready to war with the Ishmaelite army. But Morianos, becoming stubborn, thought that he himself would accomplish the work. The Arabs campaigned against the Byzantines who, g. 149, were fighting with the fortress of Naxchawan. They struck and put them to the sword and put the survivors to flight. Morianos fled to Iberia. The Ishmaelite army turned back and besieged the city of Karin, battling with it. Since, the inhabitants, were unable to resist them in war, they opened the city gates and submitted. The Arabs, entered the city, gathered up the gold, silver and entire multitude of the city's goods, robbed the entire country of Armenia, Abania slash Aguania, and Sionic, and denuded all the churches. As hostages they took the chief princes of the land, their women, and many sons and daughters. Theodoros, lord of the Rishtanic, and his relatives went along with them and took them to Asoristan. Theodoros, lord of Rishtanic, died there. His body was brought to his own district, and he was buried in the tomb of his fathers. Hamazasp, lord of the Mamikonians, son of Darwit, held authority in the land of Armenia. He was a man regarded as, 178, virtuous by everyone. But he was delicate, a reader and a scholar, not, like his patrimonial family, skilled and adept at military exercises. He did not enter battle and did not see the enemy's face. But he began to strive for the bravery native to his ancestral house, fervently striving to accomplish an act of bravery as was the wont of his ancestors. He entreated heaven to give leadership and triumph to him and to make him brave. As I said earlier, nurses, the Katagikos of Armenia, departed with the emperor and went with him to Constantinople. He was received there with honor. They gave him goods and released him to his place. He went and remained in Teke, until the lord of Rishtanic died, and the Arab raids stopped. After six years of persecution, he returned to his place and was established on the throne of the Katagikosate, g. 150. He hastened to complete the construction of the church which he had built on the avenue of the city of Vagharshapat. I have futilely strung together words into a history, following the uninspired counsel of my own mind, and not the worthy blessing of knowledge. But I did examine the order of scholars and confirmed, my account, with the words of the prophets uttered at the command of the Lord. For although, 179, the former is quickly fulfilled, the latter is fulfilled for eternity as the Lord said, heaven and earth may pass, but my words will not pass, Matthew 24. 35. For from my anger fire will be roused, will burn, and descend to the depths of hell, Jeremiah 15. 14. What, the Lord, said about these people is clear, they will be burned with fire, and the bases of their mountains will be disturbed, speaking about the tyranny of the grandee princes, I shall pour out all types of evil upon them, and exhaust them with my arrows. For just as arrows fly from the well-curved bow of a strong man toward the target, so do, the Arabs, who come from the Sinai desert to destroy the entire world with hunger, the sword, and great terror. The fact that the fire blazed out in the desert area was clearly indicated, by the Lord, when he said, I shall set incurable snares upon them, the beasts of the desert who will drag, their prey, here and there across the earth. As the prophet Daniel thundered, the fourth beast is frightful and awesome and very strong. Its teeth are iron, its claws are copper, it eats then spits out and stomps on the food, Daniel 7. 7, and so forth. The final words are, the day of, 180, their destruction is at hand, and the Lord has come upon them in his preparation, Jeremiah 46. 21. This too will be fulfilled in its own time. That same year the Armenians stopped serving the Ishmaelites and submitted to the Byzantines. 
Emperor Konstans made Hamazas, Lord of the Mamikonians, Kuropalat, giving, G-151, him a silver throne and authority over the land of Armenia. He gave honors to the other princes and treasures to the troops. When the king of the Ishmaelites saw that the Armenians had withdrawn from him, he had all of the hostages who had been taken from the country, some 1775 souls, put to the sword. Some 22, hostages, who were not in the place were the sole survivors. Now Musha, lord of the Mamikonians, was unable to quit Ishmaelite service because four of his sons were hostages kept by them. The three sons of Hamazasp and one brother were hostages. However, they sought him and other princes together with their women, to bring them to Syria. For this reason, the princes, preferred death to life, withdrew from, 181, Arab, service and, using speedy travel, submitted to the Byzantine emperor. United with them were the princes and troops of Abania slash Agawania and the princes of Sionic together with their land. Previously they had been attached to the geographical unit of Atratakan, Yashtarago and Atrapatakani to the census of Atratakan, until the Iranian kingdom was ended. When the Ishmaelites ruled, they were conquered and united with Armenia. The Arabs, arrested Musha and the other princes who were with him. The, Arab, king ordered that the other princes who had been arrested should be set free, however, he demanded that Musha remain with him. Then God sent discord into the army of the sons of Ishmael. Their unity dissolved, they clashed with each other and divided into four parts. One part was in the Indian area. Another was that army which held the Soristan and the northern areas. Another was the one in Egypt and in the Tetel region. Another was in the Tashik area and at the place called Askaron. They began fighting with each other and destroyed each other with endless killings. Now the troops who were in Egypt united with those in the, 182, Tashik area and they killed their king and took the multitude of treasures as loot, G-152. They enthroned another king and returned to their places. Now when their prince Muawiya, who was in Asoristan and was second to their king, saw what had happened, he united his troops and he too went to the desert. He killed the king whom they enthroned, battling with and severely destroying the troops in the Tashik area. He then returned to Asoristan in triumph. Now the army which was in Egypt united with the Byzantine emperor, made peace and was incorporated. The multitude of the troops, some fifteen thousand people, believed in Christ and were baptized. But the bloodshed of countless multitudes increased and intensified among the Ishmaelite armies. They engaged in frantic battles and killed each other. Nor were they able to stop even somewhat from wielding swords, taking captives in intense battles on land and sea, until Muawiya grew strong and conquered all of them. He subdued them, ruled as king over the property of the sons of Ishmael and made peace with everyone. G 153. Amen.